see now. Right. Now what's this? tank. That was destroyed by a missile which has a warhead about the size of an aubergine. Right? You know an aubergine? About this big. A bit bigger, anyway. A little bit louder, I think. Okay. This was a tank. And you know what a tank... Uh, I mean, I'm going to show this again because this is a very important piece of, of film. This is a new weapon. It's a small weapon which is used on the ground. Chris, we're going to put it yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now the important thing is, what's the last piece? The last, the last one of these. And we're going to see the tank being destroyed now. Here we are. Now look at the next one. Okay. Now what sort of machine can do that? I can tell you, there is no normal weapon that can totally destroy a tank like that, which is, which is this size. So we have to consider that there's something happening out there which is a new weapon, which is, uh, which is not the conventional weapon that was used against tanks. And that's why I wanted to start with this. To, 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 to raise the issue, which is at the back of all of the things that I've been researching for the last 15 years perhaps, certainly since the Gulf War veterans first appeared with strange illnesses. And I'm going to talk a bit about the research that I have done to try and investigate what this weapon is and what's going on. Now there are many, many organizations that are concerned about depleted uranium. Many. And so we started off thinking that depleted uranium was the cause of the Gulf War syndrome and the cause of the uh, increases in cancer and the increases in congenital malformation and various other conditions with a genetic basis that were being reported from Iraq, which is where depleted uranium weapons, and they were depleted uranium weapons then, were first used. These are little bullets or tank shells which consisted mainly of depleted uranium. That's all it was. It was just one big lump of depleted uranium and you fired it at a target and when it hit the target it exploded and produced lots and lots of very fine nanoparticles particles which were so small that they became aerosolized, they were like a gas. So they're not like, a, they're not like sand, they're, they're not like any particle that you can imagine, it's, it's just exactly like a gas. And the size of these particles is so small that they can travel through the skin. So there's not just even necessary to inhale them, they will pass through any filter that you can use to try and protect yourself from them. And there's no argument about this, because tests have been made at various uh, military bases and we've got the results of those tests and we know what the size of these particles is and we know where they can go. Now I've been to Kosovo to measure this stuff. There's one of the tanks. That was a similar tank to the one that was just blown up. And there's, there's, there I am in Iraq looking at it. It stays in the environment for a very long time, again in Kosovo. So let's just briefly go through the history of my involvement with this stuff and the history of everybody's involvement with this stuff. It was first used in any warfare in Gulf War I. And by 1996, the Gulf War syndrome was being uh, manifested in troops who had been involved in the, uh, uh, in the Iraq War. And then later on, of course, some of the troops from the Balkans started developing the same symptoms. At that time, I was, uh, and still am, um, a director, scientific director of the Low Level Radiation Campaign, which is an independent NGO. And what the Low Level Radiation Campaign is concerned about is to ensure that people realize that internal radiation uh, is ex much more dangerous than the external radiation. The external radiation being like x-rays that you have in a hospital or, or even an atom bomb where you get gamma radiation over your whole body. And the reason for this is that internal radiation produces effects which are local. So you can have a very high dose in one place and no dose somewhere else. 
And currently the way in which radiation is measured is measured in such a way that it's diluted into your entire body. So when people will tell you and the military will say to you that depleted uranium cannot be causing these effects, it's on the basis that the absorbed dose, the radiation dose from the uranium, is very, very low. And of course to the whole body the radiation dose is very low. But the trouble is that the uranium is not in the whole body, it's in one cell. So then, because of a lot of arguments with the Gulf War veterans, and I, and I was asked by the Gulf War veterans to advise them, eventually the Royal Society in the United Kingdom came in and the United States set up a congressional committee to look into the issue. But they gave, their response to it was much the response that I've just given you, that on the basis of the current risk model, the current model for radiation risk, the, 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 the doses are much too low to cause any of the effects. And, and uh, I managed to persuade the United Kingdom Environment Minister, Michael Meacher, that this was uh, a big problem, that the internal radiation, external radiation problem was real. And he set up a committee, and we made various theoretical arguments in this committee, which were all ignored. And then at the same time, the military set up a uranium oversight board, which I was also a member of, and, and the results of that um, were, were just arguments. And then round about the end of... Uh, of the 1990s, uh, Professor Durakovich managed to take samples from some Gulf War veterans and he had them analyzed in Bremen by a lady called Heike Schroeder and they showed that there were huge increases in chromosome damage and chromosomes, you know, associated with genetic material in the Gulf War veterans. So something was causing this genetic damage in the Gulf War veterans and of course we all argued that it was depleted uranium exposure to these aerosols. I was involved in another court case, which was lost because there was no money. Then I went to Iraq and to, and to Kosovo, and I talked to the cancer um, oncologists. You know, I went and visited the hospitals there and looked at the data, and it was quite clear that, that the uranium, we assumed, was causing big increases in cancer, especially in leukemia in children. Then a study occurred in 2001. The Italians started to look at the veterans of the uh, peacekeepers in the Balkans, and they found that there was a big increase in lymphoma. So then, by 2006, we had had the Gulf War, the second Gulf War, and we discovered in the filters in the United Kingdom that this material, this, ra this radioactive material, the, the, the uranium, was coming all the way from Iraq to the United Kingdom. It was picked up in the filters, and there was a big peak in the filters at the time of the Second Gulf War. So, the, so that showed that, that, that it didn't stay put on the battlefield. It, it traveled all over the place, and it affected everybody. Then by around about that time also, I developed a, a theory about how, it, how this works, which I'll come to later on, called the secondary photoelectron effect, which has now generally been accepted uh, as, as being real. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. We found high levels of natural uranium in the troops who had served in the Second Gulf War. But it wasn't depleted uranium. So the first sign that we were seeing was that there was a lot of uranium in the urine, but it wasn't depleted uranium. And everyone was saying they hadn't used depleted uranium. So then we got to, uh, there was a coroner's inquest in 2009 in which I argued uh, that the uranium would cause the cancer in, in, a, in a veteran and we won that. The jury took a decision to say that the, that the uranium caused the cancer. Then in 2006, we started to, to find enriched uranium in the Lebanon. We went to a big bomb crater there that was slightly radioactive, and we took samples, and we looked in an ambulance filter, and we found enriched uranium. And that was the first time that it seemed like there was something odd about this whole question about depleted uranium, that it was no longer depleted uranium that we were worried about. It could be something different. And, and so we had to try and find out what it was and see whether we could make some sort of progress because all along what people were doing was saying there's no problem, the doses are too low, the uranium can't cause these effects, we don't even use depleted uranium. There's no increase in cancer in Iraq, there's no increase in congenital malformations in Iraq. I have a, I have a paper here written by, the, uh, by a British government minister in which he says that the number of um, gene genetic malformation cases in Fallujah is two or three in a year. Two or three in a year. This is an official document from the British government. So what could we do? Well, I was contacted by 
um, a, 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 an Iraqi lady uh, born in England who wanted to try and do something, Malak Hamdan, and she said, is there anything that we can do? We've got very little money, nobody will do anything, the World Health Organization isn't interested, nobody will look, what can we do? And I have to say that I had already been asked this question by other people in the Green Movement, and I had told them what could be done. We could go in there and we could knock on the doors and say, excuse me, is there anybody here who's got cancer in the last five years? And this is a very simple way of doing epidemiology. It used to be a method that was used a long time ago. You go from door to door, you find out how many people live there, you find out how many cancers there were there in the last five years, and you can work out what the expected number is, and you can look to see what you find. And she said, OK, well, let's go for it. So she put her hand in her pocket to take money out of her pocket to start this off, because none of us have any money in this game. And then a few people uh, gave us a little bit of money here and a little bit of money there, and we sent this out to Iraq, to Fallujah, and we decided to look at Fallujah because that was the place where all of the cancers seemed to be concentrated. So, Because in epidemiology, you need to find a single area to study. Now, we, needed to, we were thinking of studying Basra originally, but, but because Fallujah had been in the news, and because Malak knew some people from Fallujah, we decided to concentrate on Fallujah. So, as I say, the, all of these things happened. The official bodies denied all the effects. The Gulf War veterans would say, they said they had post-traumatic stress. Uh, there were increases in cancer that were denied, but and no studies were done, done to see if there, if, there were any, if there were any real levels of cancer. The, the WHO sent somebody out there, and they reported that the, that the Iraqis didn't have proper computer systems, and therefore couldn't, use, couldn't keep proper records, and therefore they, they, they wrote off all of these questions of increases in cancer. So they called them anecdotal. So we had to decide to see if we could do a study, and we did this. And also, of course, I have to say that there were a lot of black operations against researchers and the infiltration of the green movements and computer hacking and funding support loss and all sorts of black ops were taking place throughout all of this. Now, this is something that I don't like to do, but I think you have to see the kind of thing that's happening here and why we're concerned. Because these sorts of malformations are very rare. And so what's happening here is something that's not normally a congenital malformation. There's something very strange going on here. I, I don't want to upset you, so I'm going to put that over quickly. Pardon me, where was that from? This is Fallujah. That was from Fallujah. That was a, a, a birth in Fallujah. And I've got, a, I've got a computer full of the pictures that are just as horrible. You know, so I, I don't like this because it, 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 it's, necessary, it's necessary to realize that there are some... One of yours, is it? We just need to see the photo again, please. Are you sure? Yeah, that one. Thanks a lot. Okay. They wanted to take a photo oh, of it, they? yeah? Sorry, well, there you are. Take a photo of it. It's okay, yeah. we have done it. It's You're okay. all right? Uh -huh. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the solution was to actually go ahead and do it. You know, I, I, I'm a sort of think-do person. I mean, there are a lot of people who talk, uh, talk, talk persons, you know. I mean, quite a few of them, really. I mean, in fact, most of them. But, but to me, you know, to think is to do. If you can do it, so we did it. So we decided to see, <coughs> to carry out the studies. And, and this is basically to see if there is an increase in cancer, if there is an increase in congenital malformations, and to try and use some kind of reputable epidemiological method so it can be published in a journal. Because nowadays nobody will listen to you unless you publish it in a peer review literature. So that's what we had to do. To see if uranium can be measured in the people, if uranium can be measured in the environment, and to publish it. So what we did then is we chose the area, which was Fallujah. This was an area where the congenital malformations and the cancer were said to be high. We got together some money to pay the researchers. This is Malak putting her hand in her pocket, and then I went around and did a bit of charming. I'm quite good at charming people, so I charmed a lot of people in Al Jazeera, as it happens, but don't tell anybody, But because anyway, they're, not, you know, they're not allowed to fund this stuff. So they put their hand in their pockets and so forth. You know, so. It was, it's, it, this stuff is incidentally, it's all very James Bond, you know. You get money in brown envelopes and you meet people on platforms with samples who've got like a daffodil, you know, and you say, oh yes, and you know, the, the rain is very heavy today in Iraq. No, it isn't, and all that stuff, you know. Anyway, it's quite exciting. Um, and then money to pay for the measurements, which we got, and, and of course, as I said, charm and good luck. Well, we had all of that. So we, 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 we chose the pollution, we did all of the three studies. Now, this was the first study I'll tell you about, but there were two other studies, and the second one was quite expensive. 
And as I said, nobody took any money. We, this, the, the money was just, just there. To, we had to buy a generator for the people in Iraq because half the time they didn't have electricity. And then we had to buy them a photocopy to photocopy the, the, uh, the, the questionnaires and, and, and some mobile phones so that they could communicate with each other and so forth. So here's the first study. The first study uh, involved visiting some families in uh, uh, cho choosing an area of Fallujah and just knocking on doors and asking how many people lived there, how, uh, what ages there were, uh, the five-year age groups you need to know, 0 to 5, 5 to 9, 10 to 14, and so on, all the way right through, so that you can make a list of the, age, uh, of the age, ages of the population, and then you can apply the cancer rates to see what you would expect to get if you were living in some control country, and we used Egypt and Jordan as control countries, and then compare the cancers that are reported to the ones that you would expect over the period of the study, which is five years, 2005 to 2009. So this was published in, in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, which is a respectable Swiss journal, and it was reported in all the major news media and had more than 18,000 downloads from the journal website, which is quite unusual. This, is, this meant it was, a, and it's all over the internet. There we are, 700, uh, we, 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 we organized 700 random homes and we got um, the sex and the age of 4,800 people and, and uh, they, they, produced, they, they also gave us the, the, the numbers of cancers and the types of cancers, also the birth, the, the numbers of infant deaths and also the sex ratio at birth we could work out from the populations. And the sex ratio at birth is important because if it's if it's uh, quite different from the normal sex ratio, the re sex ratio is the number of boys to the number of girls, basically. So you write it down as something like 1,050. So the normal standard sex ratio in, in every population is 1,050 boys to 1,000 girls. And if it's, if it's markedly different from that, then there's been some sort of genetic damage or terrorist of genetic damage inside the womb. So we compared the cancer rates with Egypt, and we find very high rates of cancer, absolutely extraordinarily high rates of cancer, uh, rates of cancer that are unheard of, that have never, never been seen in any epidemiological study in history, basically. So something truly extraordinary has happened there. Um, and then, um, so which I'll, I'll show, I, well, I was going to go to the paper, I don't think I've got time to go to the paper because I've got a lot of things to say, but I can show you roughly what we found. So we found Childhood cancer, um, 12 times higher than the expected numbers in Egypt or in Jordan. I mean, this is an enormously high rate. But then if you go down to leukemias, uh, all leukemia in the age group 0 to 34. Now, leukemia is a, is, a, is a cancer that's particularly associated with radiation. We had 20 cases in this small population, which gave us a relative risk of 38. That means we've got 38 times more leukemia in this population over that five-year period than would be expected. 38 times. This is, just, this is just unbelievable. I can tell you that at Hiroshima, the increases after the Hiroshima bomb were 17 times. And there were enormous amounts of radiation there. So this is worse than Hiroshima. And, and that's what I said. And it was splashed all over the media. Very high levels of lymphoma, breast cancer. You see breast cancer is almost 10 times higher. Brain tumors. Now, it's, uh, cancer is caused by genetic damage, so this was caused by genetic damage. Now, the infant mortality rate was 80 per 1,000 live births, getting worse towards the end, and the sex ratio was also perturbed, with 860 boys born to 1,000 girls. And remember, it should be 1,050. So this was highly statistically significant, and it points to some sort of genetic or genomic damage being caused in this population. So then the question is, what is the cause? Now, we were very careful in that paper not to say anything about uranium, except to say that, that people had suggested it was uranium, that's all. But we couldn't say whether it was uranium or not, because this was an epidemiological study. All we could say is that those people who had been saying that there were high levels of cancer and congenital malformation were correct, that they were enormously high levels. So it was no longer anecdotal now. It was a scientific fact, if you like, in the literature and had to be considered. And in fact, we went to the, the, the Human Rights Council in Geneva and presented this paper. Of course, they did nothing. We told the, the, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they did nothing as well. But at least it's formally there in the system now. 
So in the second study, we decided to see if we could find out whether it was uranium or, or what it could be. So what we did is we took, 20, we took samples of hair from 25 parents, or, or rather from the parents, mothers and fathers of 25 children, and we analyzed the hair by inductively coupled mass spectrometry, uh, a, a very uh, a modern, sophisticated technique, and in fact the instrument we used was, was st absolute state-of-the-art, very, very powerfully um, sensitive instrument, which is in Germany. Um, and the idea was to look at 52 elements, including uranium, and see whether there were any increased levels of, of, of elements that could explain these high levels of genetic damage. And we also, rather, I think cleverly, decided to look along the length of the hair, because Muslim women have quite long hair, and we had one woman with 80 centimeter hair. Now the point is that, that you, you excrete your uranium, or whatever it is, into the hair at a rate uh, of which the hair grows. Hair grows one centimeter in a month, so if you've got 80 centimeters hair, the end of your hair started to grow from your head 80 months ago. And this took us back almost to Fallujah, almost back to 2000 and, uh, the beginning of 2005. So if you like, we can see the length of hair as a sort of historic record of the contamination, if we should find any. And of course we did find stuff. We found, and this, uh, and this, but this is the paper that I was here to talk about now. This was published in September, uh, just a few, a few, you know, a month ago, uh, in a journal called Conflict and Health. And you might question why we didn't publish it in the other one, the International Journal of Environment and Public Health. And the answer is because they were got at. Um, when this paper was still on my computer, somebody wrote to them and said that Busby is about to send you a paper about uranium in the hair, and you mustn't publish it because he's a nutcase and you know a mad guy and he's a liar and he's made it all up and this and that. And also they, were, they, they came under some threats because I, I phoned up the editor of this journal this is not the scientific editor, this is the, the journal editor, and he said, oh yes, well, we've been threatened and I'm afraid we can't publish this paper. So they didn't even take the paper and send it off for peer review. But the interesting thing about it is they knew about the paper before it left my computer. And so we know also that a number, a number of my co-workers co co also had people hacking into their computers. There. So, so we are being observed quite closely by, by, by the, the forces that don't want this stuff out. So I sent it quite carefully to another journal called Conflict and Health, which is quite an obscure journal, and we bought mobile phones which, which weren't registered to anybody, and we, we sent these papers from computers that weren't the computers that we normally use. And so we had to do all this James Bond stuff. And eventually, of course, you know, it worked. It's after, after a lot of uh, aggro with, with uh, referees and whatnot, and arguments with the Lancet, the Lancet did, threw it out altogether. And I wrote to the editor of the Lancet and threatened to put him on the front page of the newspaper and all this stuff. So you know, so we got it all got quite heavy, I have to say. But anyway, the paper got published, and what the what the paper showed was extraordinary. And here is what it showed. No, this is this is what I've just told you really about all this secrecy stuff, right? And then, of course, after it was published, the journal received loads of letters rubbishing me, rubbishing our work, and saying that Malak was some agent of Zionism. And, I don't know, all sorts of stuff about, about it. And my professor at my university was written to and said that I should be kicked out, and maybe I will be. It's entirely possible. So this is what we found. We found significant excess concentrations of many, many elements, but the only element that could explain the congenital malformations was uranium. So yes. So the answer to the question, uranium, yes. The answer to the question, depleted uranium, no. The uranium was enriched. It was slightly enriched in the hair, and it was slightly rich, enriched in the surface soil also. So we're back to Lebanon now. We've got the same deal as we had in Lebanon. We were finding enriched uranium in people. And I have to say that there also was a study done on a Balkans veteran uh, by a team at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, and they looked in this guy's kidney. They took a kidney sample. This guy was suffering from Gulf War syndrome. So he had the standard Gulf War syndrome, very sick man and they decided to find out what was causing it, and they looked at everything. They took every single test that was possible to do. They went to town on this guy, they dismantled him, and they took uh, samples of his kidney, and they measured, uh, using an electron microscope, concentrations of uranium, and they found that his kidney was full of uranium, and it was enriched uranium. So again, we have this enriched uranium signal coming up. The levels of uranium were three times higher than the control group in Israel and six times higher than the control group in Sweden. Now, you know in Sweden there's got quite a lot of uranium. It's not a place where there's a small amount of uranium. 
And the indication from the long hair study, so when we go along the hair, it goes up as you go back into the past. So that by the time you got back to, the, to 2004, it would have been 60 times higher than the Sweden control. So, so, the, so the answer to the question is, it's, is, is what's causing this, this is most likely, we can't say for sure, because maybe there was something else that we didn't find or we didn't look at or whatever, but the most likely explanation, since we know that uranium is, is a genotoxin, does cause genetic damage, we found enriched uranium at very high concentrations in the, in the parents of these children with congenital anomalies. So the most likely explanation, in England what we call Occam's razor, we look for the most likely single explanation, that is it, that the uranium caused, caused it. So then the question is, could it have been an, a nuclear bomb? So we also looked to see if there was any radioactive fallout. We looked for cesium-137, which is the standard signature of a fission bomb. There was no cesium-137. We also looked for tritium in the wells, and we didn't find any tritium. But it's possible that it, was, that it would have been there and it had gone by the time we got there. Because remember, it's five, six years after the thing happened, and tritium is just like water, so it can get dissipated. So we're not sure about that. I was going to go to the paper, but there's no time. So the question is, what is the origin of the enriched uranium? So first of all, I'm saying it is clear that there is a new weapon being used. It's not an anti-tank weapon, it's an anti-personnel weapon. And it either incorporates or it produces uranium-235, which is the fissile component, the enriched part of the uranium, of enriched uranium. Now, what sort of weapon could it be? Well, one possibility is quite simple. It's what's called a thermobaric or focused charge weapon. Now, you just saw that picture of the tank being destroyed. Now, I have to tell you that an explosion, when you decide to blow something up, what you do is you use an explosive which causes an enormous increase in pressure very suddenly. It goes bang, and it pushes air out. And air consists of nitrogen mainly. And nitrogen is a very light molecule. It's got an atomic number of 14 and a vapor density of 7. Okay? So when the, when, the, when the explosive force hits you, if you're standing there and somebody blows you up, you get thrown backwards by the shock wave, which is a lot of nitrogen molecules coming at you. Bang. But if you mix up uranium, with your explosive, then the, then the molecules that are coming at you are not nitrogen molecules, which weigh seven, but they're uranium molecules that weigh 119. Okay, so you've got so you've got an extremely powerful weapon just by mixing nuclear waste in with a na natural explosive. That's all you have to do. And if you make a focused charge, in other words, say you don't just have a lump of this stuff, but you make it into a sort of concave um, pattern. Uh, and it explodes, then it will focus the, 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 the uranium in one direction. It's called a focus charge. And that's the kind of thing that destroyed that tank. So that's one possibility. And the reason is, is this, the energy of any weapon, uh, of any uh, atoms, uh, uh, is to, uh, of any uh, air molecule, is a half mv squared. And if you increase m from nitrogen to uranium, which is the heaviest atom that there is on Earth, then you've got a very, very much larger and more powerful explosive. And that one that I showed you is called javelin. So they, that these could be used in Fallujah and actually they said that they were. So we have a patent that, that shows that these, this one, Toe, is designed to have a, a uranium warhead. And we know that uh, from, from a book that was written called The Battle of Fallujah by one of these American soldier people that they did use those weapons then. So it's entirely possible that they just put everything that they had into Fallujah in the way of in the way of uranium weapons, so, but, but it still doesn't explain why, why enriched uranium. So one possibility is that they just used enriched uranium because they wanted to cover their tracks and they didn't want people coming along afterwards measuring depleted uranium and then suing them <coughs> for, 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 for using an outlawed weapon. So they wanted to make it look natural. But again, they could have used natural uranium. So, so the question is, why enriched uranium? Well, one possibility is they want to get rid of decommissioned warheads because they have a lot of nuclear warheads under, the, under the, the, the salt limitation treaties that they have to get rid of, Russian warheads, American warheads. And this stuff becomes just nuclear waste. So, they could, so one way to do it was just to mix it with depleted uranium and shoot it at people you don't like. Or, finally, and this is an entire possibility, is an entirely new weapon, a cold fusion neutron bomb, which the Russians called red mercury, and which they said that they had in the 90s. And this sort of bomb uses tritium dissolved in, tritium is heavy hydrogen. Uh, uh, actually, this is wrong. This is deuterium, and it produces tritium. So it's a fusion bomb. 
it causes it, it, uh, what you do is you dissolve the hydrogen in the uranium and when you compress it it becomes super saturated because the hydrogen atoms get stuck or the deuterium atoms get stuck between the huge uh, electron rich uranium atoms and then it, they fuse to form helium 4 and that produces an enormous amount of energy a big gamma ray pulse and a lot of neutrons and that could also be the cause of this genetic damage the third paper how are we doing for time? We're done? Um, we better just do the third paper. Quickly. All right. The third paper is not yet published. It was sent to be published, but it was rejected, you know, by this journal, by that journal, and, and so on and so forth. And it's not that. It is important, but it's not as important as the other two. And what this does is it addresses the arguments about congenital malformations, because, what, what the, because the fallback position of the Iraqi government was that, oh, well, you know, they all marry their sisters. And so they're bound to have a high level of, con well, they're cousins, so they're bound to have a, light, a high level of congenital malformation, you see. Um, so you can, you can allow for that. You can actually uh, weight the results for the congenital uh, um, consanguinity, for the fact that people are marrying their cousins. Because it does, it does increase the inbreeding, and so you do get a slightly higher level of, of um, congenital malformations. But you can control for it. So I controlled for it in this paper, but it was rejected. And it's now been sent to another journal. I won't tell you which one. So, yeah, so uh, go to paper. It says, well, I'm not going to go to paper, but, but, but what the paper basically shows you is that the rates of congenital malformation in each class, so we were able to look at congenital heart defects and neural tube defects. This is like spina bifida and hydrocephalus and then kidney damage and all the various different classes of congenital malformation uh, were significantly high. I mean, of the order of the same as the cancer. So you're talking like 10 times higher, 15 times higher, 20 times higher, that kind of thing. So those rates of cancer that were enormously high are all re also there enormously high in the congenital malformations. So there's only one more thing left to do, if possible. And that is this, that we have, uh, uh, my colleague Alexei Yablokov has put me in touch with a, 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 a geneticist in Moscow who is able to do chromosome damage uh, measurements. And, and the chromosome aberrations uh, are, are uh, indicative of radiation exposure and they can be tied directly to alpha particle exposure. So the, di so the proportion of dicentric rings and centric chromosomes in any, in any peripheral lymphocyte uh, um, culture uh, it, it, it is an indication of the type of exposure that, that these people have had. So what we can do is we can take some controls, we can, take, so we can take the women that we already have with the uranium, we can take samples of blood from them, and then somebody has to put them in their, into their bra and get on the plane to Moscow, because they've got to get to Moscow in 48 hours. But we have got people who will do that, and even my friend, who's got a fat guy, will put a bra on and he'll put them in there and take them to Moscow. So it's possible, but we need money for this. Um, and I don't think we have any more time for me to say anything else. So I think if you want to ask questions about this, there we go. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Just yeah. to return to you, but I, I, I would like Anders to say something very shortly. Uh, 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 yes, very briefly. I just want to mention that the first uh, scientific meeting on depleted uranium here in Sweden took place in Luleå, northern uh, uh, Sweden, during this week. It was organized by the Luleå University of Technology, which have 18 graduate students from Iraq in collaboration <coughs> with uh, scientists from Iraq and also representatives of uh, the, the government. Uh, at the meeting, the, the recommendation was uh, issued in uh, unity by the scientists directly to the representatives of the government, uh, briefly confirming the picture of a largely increased rate of congenital malformations in Iraq. Secondly, that uh, many sites, up to 300 uh, uh, or places in Iraq, had been contaminated by depleted urine. It's a large environmental a problem. It is also said that uh, this was due uh, uh, to the wars in, in these recommendations from the scientists, which uh, uh, urged or uh, asked the government to take various kinds of action, uh, actions 
to re remove in the best way uh, the contaminated soils uh, to uh, support further scientific studies in this to inform uh, the public uh, also. It was also mentioned here that so to say um, the recommendations of you were in line with uh, a resolution taken by the great majority of st uh, member states by United Nations one year ago. There was one stage 148 states supported it, four states were against it. I say and we're here more as an engaged private person, United States, Israel, French and United Kingdom and Sweden abstained from taking a stand here on Twitter. Well, so briefly, uh, the first, this first scientific uh, meeting gave a similar picture of the situation. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, it was here suspected, so to say, that diluted uranium uh, might be a cause, but also enriched uranium was mentioned, uh, but would also ask for further scientific proof, uh, not least by uh, representatives of the government. This is, uh, I just okay. thought I'd put this up. This, this is the, the paper on congenital malformations and these are the rates. So these, these are, these are, this is the crude rate, that's the European rate. So, that, so you can work out the expected number and the relative risk compared to the European system. And this is adjusted for consanguinity. So what we've done is we've taken the populations of Pakistan and Iran and uh, uh, various other Arab countries where they do have uh, a culture of marrying their cousins and so people have studied this and they've studied people who've married their cousins and compared them to people who haven't married their cousins in the same population and you, and you do have an effect but it's not a very big effect so what we do is we multiply by the effect and then we come out with an answer which gives us an approximate idea of how bad it is and you can see for congenital heart defects it's about five times higher than it should be um, and for some of these, a particular kind of heart defect, you've got you've got ten times higher. Uh, and these these are sta these are standard ones. See, look here's ear, face, and neck. So you saw this one with the with the the single eye with two pupils. That was an ear, face, and neck one. So you've got a very high level of that, eight eight times. Now. And then digestive system seven point, nervous system nine times. Um, these are all heart defects. So uh, the point about this is this is real. This is one pediatrician who we asked to write down all of the defects, all of the congenital malformations for one year that went through her particular pediatric um, consultancy. And she recorded all of them. And so this is the result of that. So this is, there's, no, there's no argument about this. It's not anecdotal evidence at all. This is real. Uh, and again, we kind of thought it would be anyway, but at least you know this, this is official. So if we, when we get this published, so that will be one more paper that they can ignore. Um, before we discuss these shocking findings, Cillian made up from the Rex already. I will say it in Swedish. At förstör 